Hey there, and welcome to Work Dope, a podcast on the messiness and the potential of humans at work. I'm Linda Stacy, and I'm a corporate sellout, and I like to think of myself as a corporate innovator. I think that working in corporate America doesn't have to suck, even though, admittedly, it often does. By some statistics, up to 80% of the workforce are unsatisfied and disengaged at work. And what's paradoxical here is that people more and more are expecting to get meaning and purpose and create their identity based on their roles at work. The pandemic and the great resignation, all of this has forced us to take a look at the quality of life and what culture really means for people inside of organizations. In fact, I think business is cool. I think organizational life can be very exciting. I think that building solutions and solving real world problems and creating all of these things are fundamental to the best parts of what it means to be human, to live out our human experience, to actually embrace human potential. In this episode, I flesh out a process for improved human to human connection at work. I'm using the feedback wheel framework of Pia Melody and I'm combining it with a cool assessment to help you to ground yourself in your value and another tool to help you get really clear on what you really want. The best part is this process helps us to reverse engineer towards harnessing better the three things that we actually have control of, our actions, our reactions, and our mindset. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about more tools around how to navigate sometimes difficult things, different relationships, challenging interactions at work. And to be clear, my take is that unless something is at stake, this really won't matter to you. Like if you actually want something to change or to affect something, then here are some tools that might help you to be even more effective maybe than you already are. Or if you don't feel like you have any of these, here is a starting point, a framework to get going. As I've said more than once on this podcast, relationships really do hold the greatest opportunity for growth. And relationships go through cycles. I learned a lot from Terry Real and Pia Melody over the last several weeks around these cycles of harmony, disharmony, and then repair. And this happens at work too, right? With the right approach, these cycles can actually contribute to our own up-leveling. So there are times in relationships, whether at work or other places, where you might end up in some kind of disharmony. You know that things are not going well. Maybe there's even silent treatment for a while or you're avoiding for a while. And then it kind of goes away and then you move on. However, with this type of approach, we're trying to use it to catalyze something different and, and to up-level and to actually make something cool happen as a result. And of course, this doesn't always feel good, you know, these cycles and and not being in the best places all the time. It all forces us to take a look at parts of ourselves that we don't always want to look at, right? But again, it's all a route to help us get to something better. So something similar, but not exactly the same. I was listening to an Olympian talk about some words of wisdom that she got from a coach And it was around, you know, being on the mat, if you will. Of course, it might be in the pool or, you know, on the diving board, whatever your particular sport is. But these people are basically doing workouts for a living. The coach had shared that a third of the time, the work of this is not going to feel very good. A third of the time, it's going to be kind of neutral. And a third of the time, it's going to feel really great. And it's knowing this that helps us not be so judgmental about the times when it doesn't feel great. It's our human experience that not everything feels great all the time. And of course, we want to lean in towards what feels better, but not having so much negative judgment around ourselves or a situation around when things don't feel good, I think is helpful. I think it's helpful at work and I think it's helpful in relationships in general. So again, more about what this has to do with work. I know sometimes I have felt like everything was fucked up because my day felt off or incongruent. No one recognized me today or there was no creativity in my work today. And that was definitely like a victim mindset that I held for a very long time. And to be honest, this still happens from time to time. I get into a weird funk. Something might happen that's external to me that kind of triggers this. I'm very aware of it. And of course, all of everything that I'm talking about here, it also has some analogies inside of sports. You know, a football game 
is not a series of touchdowns. And especially, you know, we see this sometimes where a teams are not evenly matched. And those games where it's just touchdown after touchdown actually get boring, right? Isn't it much more exciting and interesting when there's more happening on the field, more back and forth, more, um, you know, interaction, losing yards, gaining yards? We kind of want an exciting life. And if everything is one way too much of the time, it gets kind of boring. And again, these weird shitty things that happen, they're opportunities and they're ways of making it all more cool if we're able to embrace it in the right way. So, and when I say right, ugh, I don't want to use that word too much, but in a in a constructive way, maybe. So again, don't judge your days too harshly. Growth might be happening even under the surface, even when it feels like a really shitty day. These, in fact, are the days where there is more potential for growth. So we're going to go over a process here, and this really is for times when something is at stake at work. We're going to be using the feedback wheel framework. Jerry and Christy mentioned it in episode eight, and it actually comes from Pia Melody, who I've mentioned before, and it's used by Terry Real in his work. And I'm going through these processes and I'm adapting them for work. And parts of these actually Brene Brown talks about in a couple of her books using various aspects of this to have a constructive conversation at work and to get you into repair, get you out of this kind of disrepair, out of disharmony with either another person or with your feelings around work and moving towards something more, something more constructive. So we're talking about tools for connection and not everyone is connecting in healthy ways, but certainly we all need to connect with each other if we're working together, right? But we're not always doing this in healthy ways. And in fact, sometimes all we want to do is complain. And in Terry Reel's book, when he's talking about couples interacting with each other, he says very clearly that complaining will get you nowhere. All it is is just this need or desire to kind of dump on someone. And if you think that there's no hope, you will stay exactly where you are. So just staying in a state of complain really isn't going to get you anywhere. Although I will say that those moments in complain do lend themselves to the roots of where you might grow. And we'll get to that in just a minute. If you can get to a point where you move away from complain and you act from a different part of yourself, something major has likely just happened inside of you. You now are deciding differently from your wise adult self instead of spiraling down into this place of complain. And I want to say, I know that sometimes at work, things just aren't going well or they haven't gone well for years. Maybe there's some situation that is just nagging. I've seen this in work situations before where for years and years, people are complaining about the same thing. If you're choosing to stay in that space, there is an agreement there. You are at some point that the complaining isn't necessarily going to help you. If you've already tried to make changes and nothing's going to happen and you've decided to stay in the role, I don't think it makes sense to continue to complain about the thing. There is some kind of tacit agreement in the fact that you've stayed in the role, understanding what the various parameters are. So talking a little bit about this wise adult, and it's in contrast to the adaptive child. This comes from the work of psychology. There's a lot to it. Terry Real talks about it quite a bit. And wise adults are using their prefrontal cortex, the most developed part of the brain. I talk about that, I think, in episode two or three. And the prefrontal cortex stays rooted in the bigger goals and resists knee-jerk reactions. The adaptive child, and every single human being on the planet has an adaptive child, operates pretty much from a place of overwhelm and helplessness. And how you react to overwhelm and helplessness might differ from the way a coworker does. So some people, if they're in that state of overwhelm or helplessness, they might come across as um, angry. They might come across as escaping or neglecting or avoiding a situation. So how it actually ripples out might be different. I have had overwhelm and helplessness in spades. I'm highly aware of this (laughs) and I've worked really hard to not do it so much, but I still fall into it from time to time. As children, we did things to survive in the various environment that we were in. And because none of our parents are perfect, we all have little things that we adopted over the years to help us really survive in those moments. And when you're four or five years old and you're not properly being taken care of, there is the capacity or there is the potential that that you would die. A child who is neglected 
does die. So there's something very big at stake when you are four or five and you feel that your fundamental needs aren't being met. That experience translates into our adult life. It's in our emotional system. And when we feel that something is threatening like that, there is this linking towards the sense of, you know, I'm going to die. And I, I don't, <laughs> it's kind of a loose thing. We're not really going to die. But just sometimes we have that feeling like there's no way out of a specific situation. So as adults, we can access tools. I think we need to be taught what the tools are. We need to learn them. We need to build awareness so that we can approach things in a better, more enlightened, more evolved way. We want to move out of what was survival. The adaptive tools that we learned as little kids were around survival. And we really want to move towards thriving, which really means that we're seeing other people in our environments as people that we can collaborate and learn to understand and learn to work with in order to up-level. Now, sometimes people don't think they need this, and some people have already turned this podcast off because it doesn't apply to them, so to speak. I've known leaders who have passed up leadership coaching, skills improvement, and to be honest, I don't know if they passed it up because they felt they didn't need it or they didn't have time, but we all can improve on these things, right? And even if the other person in your relational situation is not working on these, it still behooves you to know what these are and to use them to up level, to be better. There's no ultimate final destination where we've all arrived and we no longer need to work on these skills and tools. We always have room to improve. You know, Dave Ramsey, someone who talks about money, talks about how every family has a little bit of crazy in it. And then he says, and if you don't think yours does, it's probably you. <laughs> and I think this is really funny because Everything makes logical sense to us as individuals, right? So, you know, of course, how I'm thinking about something makes total sense. <laughs> but surely you've been in a situation with a partner or a boss where something they're saying doesn't seem to make any sense, right? You think that they're crazy. You think that they're nutso. And I know, too, that there are times in my primary relationship where my husband doesn't get my logic around something. He thinks I'm nutso or I think he's nutso. All of these things. But within the individual who is expressing whatever the thing is that's coming across as nutso, there's logic for that individual. So if we can be curious about what that logic is in a way that is open to really understand the path that brought them to the destination in their thinking, we're doing it with curiosity and not judgment, we are going to be in a much better place to understand others and also understand ourselves and get to a place where we're understanding our own nutso and where we can improve. I also want to say that not every disruption in our work life warrants an approach like this, right? There are some things that eventually you just let go and we get better and better at letting certain things go. There are times when I think something has happened in a certain way or I'm inferring, I'm doing extra filling in of the blanks that isn't serving me. And then I can take a moment and say, you know what, I don't think this really even matters right now. And it's not going to impact my ability to do my job. And I back up and I choose not to engage. I didn't choose not to go down that rabbit hole of thought that might, might drain me, quite frankly, and take away the precious energy that I want for better things. So there's a few different steps in this process that I'm going through. And the first one is really asking the other person if they're willing to listen. I like to say you can go through this entire process. It's like four or five steps on your own. It doesn't have to involve another person. It's going to in your own mind because you're going to be having like a conversation with that person or developing some thoughts around an exchange with that person. But it doesn't always have to include the other person. You could just go through this as a type of journaling exercise. So if you do want to bring up a kind of touchy situation or something that happened with a boss or a coworker, you could start it out by saying, do you have a couple of minutes or do you have some t time to chat or when will you have time to chat? Be sure that that person is in the space where they are ready to listen and hopefully they can stay open with curiosity too. Ultimately though, you know that you don't have any control over that part. The second step is to remember motivation. Why are you really wanting to engage in this particular situation? Now, when you're in a primary relationship and that's where this feedback wheel comes from, Love is probably the actual motivation, right? You want to stay in a place of love and repair with your partner. And you've decided at some prior point that that matters to you, like when you chose to marry the person or stay committed to the person. When you're in a work situation, I believe that this should have some element of organizational goals. 
What are the goals of the organization? How do I fit inside of those goals? If any time you're having a situation at work where you need or want to up-level, there ought to be some kind of organizational goal at the end of this. So if something is happening with people that is keeping work from happening, that is part of this conversation. If there's a productivity issue because of something that feels like just egregious behavior between people, bring it back to that. Of course, we need to deal with the egregious behavior, but how is it being impacted in terms of ability to do work that points towards the goals of the organization? I also feel like taking some time to think about your own come from is really important, like who you are and really being rooted in that and not having this conversation just for validation. Terry Real, who I keep referring to, he talks about unbridled self-expression not really being helpful for couples and it's not really helpful in companies either. And I hear a lot of times that individuals say, I just want to be heard. Just wanting to be heard, I understand that you need to be seen and you need to be heard and that you have ideas that matter, but unbridled self-expression is quite different from the opportunity to share your expertise and to be recognized for the value that you bring to an organization. So that is definitely something to keep in mind, that you inviting someone to have a conversation or hoping that they would listen is not necessarily an opportunity for you to dump everything. That I think really is a great exercise for a journal. Get it all out. Express everything that is happening. And then when you can review that after you've maybe cooled down a little bit, you can see what the points are that can be addressed, that you can actually do something with once you've distilled it from all of the rest that doesn't really help the situation move forward. I want to say again, if validation is the main goal of connecting with this person, I don't think that that's a great come from. I think validation is important, but I feel like it happens later. It happens after you've decided who you are and what you bring and your value and all of that. And once you're actually sitting in that with firm conviction, it begins to come in other ways. And I think we'll see some examples of that a little bit further. There's another tool that I picked up in interview videos. If you go on YouTube, you're interviewing for a new job, various experts in the career advice will give you tools for how to express the value that you bring or the value that you've always brought in a particular space. And for me, looking back, there's a constant in my personal career history around instruction, around teaching, and that I am essentially a helper. I have always leaned in towards wanting to help people do whatever they need to do better. So that's what brought me to librarianship initially was my idea that I would help people really understand the tools to help them educate themselves. In doing this with this type of exercise with other people, one person described himself as a storyteller, and he really saw that as a thread through very different types of roles. He was in the entertainment industry for a while, and now he works in knowledge management, and he still sees this type of telling the story through the work currently in his intellectual property type of work that he does. And when I last episode, when we were talking to Amanda, the theme that I saw come through was almost like this arguer. And I don't mean that in a, you know a negative sense that she's also always arguing, but she's very good with words and picking out the gaps, she said, in people's logic. And that is an asset and that helps her. And she brings that into every organization that she works for. So is there some thread that you know that you bring And you're seated in that, you're rooted in it, you know who that is for you. There's a cool assessment that I came across last year called My Creative Type. It's mycreativetype.com and you can go through and take an assessment and you answer a bunch of questions. And like one of them is around what's your secret weapon? It's a very fun, light assessment. So the secret weapon options were curiosity or endurance. Those are two really great qualities. I definitely lean towards curiosity more than endurance. My husband can stay with something for hours and hours and hours. He's got incredible endurance and energy and mental capacity where I need breaks all the time, but I am an extremely curious person. Anyway, these are the types of questions. And then the type of person that you end up coming out, the output, mine fell with dreamer, that I'm a dreamer. And then you get this assessment. You get a written thing about about what that means for you and what you bring to organizations as a result of, of this quality and who you work best with. What is the quality of someone else that you work best with? So the options here were you could be an artist, a producer, a thinker, a dreamer, an adventurer, an innovator, 
a maker or a visionary. It's a fun exercise to go through and just help you reflect around who you are and the asset, the value that you bring to an organization that you know, that you know you are not asking for anyone's validation on that essential thing that you bring. So be grounded in who you are and also know that this evolves. And some days it feels a little shaky. Go back to episode nine on self-esteem about the fact that we are never fully up and energized and fully in our best self all the time. And that's okay. Again, not harping on it, but working towards getting back to it. So the next step in the feedback wheel is really getting through the what you saw or what you heard. If you are going to have a conversation with someone, you need to be able to give examples of of a situation that you're hoping to get better at or that you're hoping for some repair around. So what are those examples? And the next thing is around what you made up about that thing. Like this is the thing that happened and here is what I made up about it. Brene gives an example in her book of someone at a meeting. They were at a two-day meeting. And at the end of day one, Brene had to rejigger the schedule because some things were going over. And she says, so-and-so, I'm going to move you to tomorrow because, you know, just to get the schedule in place. And he, right in the moment, because they have capacity and space for this, they talk about this and the work that they do. He said, He said, Brene, the story I'm telling myself is that you've moved me to day two because we're deprioritizing the work that I've been doing for the last five weeks. Clearly that it was having an emotional impact on him, that his work was being deprioritized, it was as important. And she was able to clear up immediately, no, I'm moving you to tomorrow because I understand the importance and I want to be sure that there's enough time. And so he went to the negative of your deprioritizing and then she was able to clear it up immediately and they were able to move forward and he wasn't stewing in that all night. It's a totally natural thing for us to go to that worst possible scenario because again, it goes back to how we reacted, our knee-jerk reaction from childhood that we're in protection mode. We're feeling a little bit threatened that something about what we're doing in the world doesn't matter or is not significant when that's really not the case at all. And sometimes we're actually looking for that. We're leaning into, are people seeing me? Are people seeing me? Am I not significant? We need to start translating that into, where am I being seen? How am I seeing myself? How is my work significant? What am I proud of today? Regardless of whether or not anyone has said anything, (laughs) doesn't mean you're not having an impact. I have to tell you, aspects of what I'm talking about today, I picked up in a conference that I went to probably 10 years ago. And I have never reached out to that presenter to say, you know, what you did back then made a major impact on my life. And actually, I probably should. So she was having a major impact on me. And she has no idea. She just has to believe that it's true. (laughs) So it's like, we all just have to believe that it's true, right? So whenever you're having a conversation with someone about something like this, you've got to be clear on what you want instead. What do you want in the future? If you're kind of having a weird situation with your boss or something and you want to work in a different way, maybe you want different opportunities or different roles, how are you going to express that in a way that's really clear? It's one thing to say, I don't like the way this process is working, but it's so much different to say, could we try a different way? And then if you want to try a different way, do you have any ideas of what that different way could even be? Maybe you could do a little investigating and see if there's opportunity or budget for a different opportunity. You could always run something as a pilot too, as an offer to your boss in order to get something to maybe work a different way. Sometimes when we're just doing this as a journaling exercise and we're very frustrated and we're very much in complain mode, really the only thing that we can do is try to begin to think of the opposite of what our complaints are. Years ago, when this journey around living blueprints started, one of my biggest drains was the impact of the commute, which I've talked about, I'm sure many people already know, but when I moved within my husband after we got married, my commute increased from about 30 minutes, just under 30 minutes one way to 90 minutes one way. And most of it was spent on a commuter train coming from the north of Boston into Boston. So it was a really long commute, a very long day. It was getting up before six, getting home about seven, just very little time for anything good. And I was exhausted all the time. And it really was what I considered the source of a major drain in my life. I did know that I wanted something different. I had no idea how to approach it. Quitting the job didn't seem to be 
the answer for me. But going back to that woman that I saw at that conference years and years ago, she did an exercise in front of the room. Part of this exercise is listing all of the negative things that result from this drain. For me, it was I was exhausted all the time. I was cranky at the end of the day. I was resentful of my employer and I was resentful of my husband. The employer, that's just weird, like victim state stuff that they're doing something to me by making my day a nine hour day, various other aspects that I was very frustrated with. And then resentful, my husband, you know, his commute didn't change. He was driving to work. It was a much different experience for him than it was for me. He was also getting more sleep than I was. And he's the one that has more endurance. (laughs) Anyway, so you, you know, you write these things out. And then maybe you don't really know what to do about any of these. It just feels overwhelming. Go back to the overwhelmed child part of it. I've actually done this exercise with a few audiences. And sometimes it's really hard to get to this next step, which is to reverse the statements or make them into positives. What do you want instead? Doesn't mean you're coming up with all the action steps. You're just declaring very broadly what you want instead. So instead of exhausted all the time, I want energy at the end of the day. Instead of cranky, I might want to be excited or look forward to seeing my husband at the end of the day. Resentful of my employer, I want to appreciate my employer. Resentful of my husband, I want to appreciate my husband. Just very broad. It felt like I don't know how this is going to happen, right? I personally decided to start with the exhaustion piece because I felt like I could actually do some things there. I could work on getting to bed at the hour that made sense. I could work on various food things, get better at preparation and knowing that I was having the right food that fueled me. I could also work on more reasonable exercise schedules and things, not thinking that I'm going to be able to get in long workouts every day, but what could work inside of the schedule. What happened after this was surprising. And this is where the universe, if you will, if you're a little woo-woo, kind of comes into things. I was invited to do a session at work with a certain level of the staff where they were having an interactive conversation first, and then I was coming in to do a little session with them afterwards. But I was invited by the learning development group to come to the earlier one because they thought that it would be helpful context for what I would be teaching. And their conversation was all about how they have to manage above and below and the type of correspondence that they need to have with certain people in the organization in order to make sure their work moves forward. And my eyes opened and light bulbs went off and I became extremely empathetic to a group that I had been a little resentful towards previously. And I'm not proud of that, but I am sharing so that people can hopefully feel more comfortable to gain their own self-awareness. And some people probably actually resonate with what I'm saying. Sometimes in organizations, you get the result or the brunt of things and you don't understand how or why it's being generated. But I just learned in those moments more and more about how the business actually works. And I'm part of this and that sometimes the pressures fall to us and that there are other people in the organization that are feeling way more pressure in different ways. And who knows if they feel seen or unseen or with the voice and all those other things. But that was something that happened. I did not look for that. It, It happened and I gained massive amounts of appreciation for the people that I work for and allowed me to be the helper even better. Not that I wasn't professional before, that I wasn't doing my job fully. It just completely changed my attitude, my mindset, my come from when it came to me doing this job. So if there are things that you want to bring up with someone that are rooted in complaint, if there's any way that you can turn those complaints into the opposite and then begin to think of little steps that could move you towards whatever that opposite is. You don't even have to articulate these to anyone, though. I have to tell you, I wrote those things down, the things that I wanted instead, on a piece of paper, and I took a photo of it, and it became my screensaver on my phone. So it's what I saw every single time I looked at my phone. And being channeled in to that totally changes your mindset. That's what a vision board is for, right? It constantly reminds you of what you want to see. We're so conditioned to seeing the negative, at least many of us are, 
And the more that you're focused on it, the more you're going to see of it. Talk about negative bias. You, you can create your own positive bias too. Put some things on your phone. Put some things on your wall that you want to see more of and you will see more of it. You all know when you buy a new car, all of a sudden you see that car everywhere. There's something about that. Something is now peaked in your brain and you're looking for it and it builds on itself and you see more and more evidence of what you want and you're actually being able to feel it differently and opportunities will be different. They just are. At the end of this, the last step in this process is letting go of outcome, which seems like antithetical, right? Isn't the reason that we started to have this conversation was because we wanted to get to something better? Yes, we definitely want to get to something better. But here's the deal. By doing each piece of this, we're leaning in towards more of an organic process that's going to lead towards the better. It can be really difficult to just jump to the end. We don't really know what the end is going to be. Appreciation of my husband, that could happen in so many different ways. That can mean so many different things to so many different people, right? I could not have predicted the way that I would have gotten towards more appreciation at work. And that was just one part of it. Building my business later on and learning how business development works and all of the work it takes to actually get business, I got totally new appreciation and awareness for the people in the business development roles in my organization and the amount of time and energy it takes for the partner group to win new cases and bring in business. So again, as I go back to like my first or second episode so that I have a steady paycheck and insurance benefits. It's a huge machine that keeps this all going and having an appreciation for all of the parts helps you feel more integrated in that machine. I also could have never predicted how the actual source of the drain, the freaking train and all of that time on it, it provided the time for me to start living blueprints. It was like 45, 50 minutes. That was the amount of time I was actually on the train. The other part was spent commuting to the train station, walking from the station downtown into the building. You know, not all of it was sitting on the train, but the time I was actually sitting on the train, it was time that no one interrupted me unless it was someone talking loudly on their phone next to me, but that rarely happened. And I could write blog posts and I could create web pages. <laughs> it was like, you have no idea how things can completely turn around when you begin to lean in a different direction. Ultimately, what all of these steps did was they shifted the mindset. And what I have said before, at the end of the day, the three things that we have control over are our mindset, our reactions, and our actions. This entire process, this entire feedback wheel, if you're willing to kind of go through the steps of it, will actually help you with all three of those things. All of it pointed towards more freedom and more space for joy. I hope you take the opportunity I will summarize the steps when I say goodbye. Have a great week. There you have it. Episode 12 is in the books. Let's review the steps. These steps, again, are not only for human-to-human -human interaction. They're also steps that you can take to put yourself into better alignment for anything that you're endeavoring to do. So the first part is asking the person to listen. Are they willing to listen? Or are you setting up some time to listen? The alternative here is if you're doing this as a personal exercise, you're just going to take some time to do this process of self-reflection and a journal exercise. Or maybe it's a combination of two. Maybe the self-reflection and journal exercise eventually lead to a conversation. We always want to remember the motivation. And as part of this, we are going to be grounded in who we are. And I gave you that assessment that you can think about and, you know, who you are in a much bigger way as you also think about organizational goals and the bigger goals of being better at work and why and how you fit into the organization and what it does. The feedback wheel process itself, you describing what you experienced, what happened, and if you're doing this with a person, you're distilling it, you're getting down to the brass tacks. If you're doing it as a personal reflection exercise and you're just journaling, that's the time to really get it all out. You're always reflecting on the story that you're making up about it. What are the parts that you're filling in that you really don't know for sure are true or not? If you're having this as part of a conversation after you've said the part that you're making up or the story I'm telling myself about this is, the next thing you could say to the person on the other side is, can you help me get clear on this? This is a way of saying, you know, what's your side of this experience that we both shared in some way? And at the same time and or here, you're looking to understand 
what you would like in the future, what would be a better outcome. And then finally, letting go of outcome, which again, seems paradoxical, but in some ways you're leaning in towards what you would like broadly and then letting it unfold. The exact specific brass tacks might not be what actually unfolds, but the bigger themes are what you're going for, right? More sense of freedom, more sense of joy in your work, more sense of actual value in bringing your best creative self to the workplace and whatever those things are in a very, very broad sense. I also wanted to reflect a little bit last time, last week I mentioned my need to get to bed in order to have a better experience when I go into the office and to preserve the energy so that I have it for the things that really mean something to me. You know, I don't want these days in the office to mean that the following day or the following couple of days are kind of like, you know, recovery or something like that. So I will report that I did get into bed by nine-ish, both of the nights preceding my days in the office. I also made a rule that I was not able to, I was not allowed to look at my phone after setting up my alarm pretty much and used an actual real book to move myself into sleep mode. I also used earplugs because sometimes I can get woken up and it was good. I hit the gym in the office both days, which is awesome. I also feel that I was not terribly cranky when I got home or just kind of pummeled. I was though sufficiently tired. It's been very, very hot here. So again, just reflections and thinking more about what I want to do to ensure that I have more fuel in my tank for the things that I want to do. I'm curious to know what you're doing or are you doing things to ensure that you have more fuel in your battery for the things that really matter to you. As always, please send comments, messages, notes my way. You can even record a message and attach it to an email and send to Linda at workdopepod.com. That's Linda at W-O-R-K-D-O-P-E-P-O-D.com. And of course, leave comments or, you know, um, you can leave a review at the platform that you're listening to this. I believe that that really helps with other people finding the podcast and hopefully it's helpful for them if you find it helpful for you. I hope you have a great week. Bye-bye.